I'm Andy Packham, Chief Architect for Microsoft Ecosystem and HCL Tech. I'm here today at the Global Innovation Exchange, uh, part of the University of Washington in Seattle. And we're just spending a lot of time talking about AI, um, but how AI impacts the way that we work, the way that we think about work, and the opportunity for the future. I'm really you know, excited to be joined today by some thought leaders, um, so like key executives in the area. Um, I'll ask them to introduce themselves in a minute, um, but first I'll uh, introduce Afor. Afor is our head of uh, Gen AI globally, and I'd kind of like to start off, if, if you kind of quickly tell me a little bit about your role, and then and then we'll walk through. Hi, Sanjeev, thank you, Andy. Uh, I'm Afor, I eat uh, Gen AI for ATL Tech. I've been working for ATL for all fun was now two decades in July 2012. As part of Gen AI practice, we do a lot of solutioning for our customers on Gen AI and AI, uh, uh, and uh, now across different parts of uh, industries, vertical, and fiber business. Happy to be here. My name is Abe Thomas. I work for Microsoft. I've been there for about 14 years, and uh, I work in the digital stores business, the consumer stores business, and specifically responsible for uh, what we call enablement capabilities like product management, experimentation, data analytics, uh, and super excited media. Good. Uh, I'm Dr. Max Bowder. I work at the Mosaic Company. We are global fertilizer and mining company, and I have a dual role as Chief Information Security Officer and as Head of Technical Services. And I'm really, really excited about the promise of being able to solve problems with AI that we've never been able to solve before. And hi, I'm Allison McGarry. I work for Eaton Corporation. I'm their Vice President of IT for the Aerospace Group, and I'm based in Cleveland, Ohio. Well, thanks for having us today. No, no, thank you. So, Allison, start off. Where do you see the opportunity for AI generally across all of our businesses? Yeah, I think that there is so much potential for it and the sessions this week have really highlighted just finding uh, niche areas that, you know, we're having problems either having the right talent for or what we see are very repetitive within the industry. And where can we find some of those productivity savings? Um, where can we elevate to our team to think at a higher level and, and let AI do some of the underlying foundation work? So I think that we are um, really just at the infancy and it's, it'll be exciting to see what we can do to grow in this area. Thanks that. Hey, you have very, very different businesses. Yeah. Do you see the same, same sort of pattern or are you seeing something different for AI? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I think it's it's almost boundaryless, right? I mean, I kind of liken it to when the the PCR was introduced, and uh, uh, boy, it, it was going to completely it revolutionize movies. And then think about it—that PCR doesn't exist today anymore. Mm -hmm. Things have moved on, so we are in that early phase. Who knows if what we are talking about as potential for AI is going to be the real potential longer term? But this is where we are. It's pretty. Uh, uh, the potential is enormous, as Alison was saying, and. Uh, it's exciting to be part of this, uh, this journey right now for Microsoft. I agree. This is the tip of the iceberg, or maybe just the drip of the iceberg. <laughs> There's so much that we haven't even thought about yet. And when we started with the Internet, we had no idea what we would be doing with it 30 years later. And this will still be around in 30 years from now. And today we can't even envision what problems we might be able to solve. So I'm very excited to be here and to be talking about this and to think about how we best proceed and learning about the approach. And I agree with you, it's smarter to have small use cases and go after real problems that we can fix than to go after that one killer app or the one silver bullet, right? Go after a real use case, use AI that makes sense, yeah. and then take it from there. Yeah, I think that's important though. And I keep saying this, we're all learning. You know, the nobody yet has got full answers. So kind of starting small, experimenting, Finding the right the right business case where we can really show value rather than just keeping experimenting really good. But you you know you talk to so many customers. Yeah, is this what you see? Do you see a consistent pattern or yes? Is it I different? think that I, there's definitely a consistent pattern, and not not only that. If you look at the last two years, there's been an explosion of lot of AI use cases, and customers do want to prioritize in the in the right use case on vectors of where does it create a maximum business impact. At the same time, ensure that there's a risk element of implementing AI solutions that's well managed, right? So you look at both the vectors that kind of look at the right use case. Uh, what we're seeing is very interesting. Uh, 2023 was the year of POCs. You've got a lot of POCs. Right? 2024 is the year of production of you know, well-defined use cases, which can scale beyond managed. Uh, going forward, uh, we see 
more and more use cases of the AI uh, across different parts of the organization. Uh, cust some customers are using it for productivity benefits, as you mentioned, it's, uh, right? Efficiency and productivity. Some customers are using AI for creating new businesses or new products, right? Then there are others we are using it for training their own, own people on new technology, new skills. So I think there are different ways of implementing AI solutions and AI uh, now uh, propositions. And we are seeing in HCL Tech, we are seeing a variety of extreme skills. Thanks. Uh, Matt, I want to turn back to you as something in, you know, you've got this dual role. Um, how do you as a CISO see this? You know, do, you, do you see this a lot of challenges, a lot of risk, or you know, how are you seeing the opportunity versus the risk? Uh, both. Uh, I agree. It's not very comforting that AI has all these advances. Uh, there's this old saying, don't take a knife to a gunfight, don't take a human to an artificial intelligence fight. So it is very important to stay abreast of the threat landscape and use artificial intelligence to defend against threats that include artificial intelligence. So it goes both ways, and we need to be aware of both sides of the coin. So Anderson, you see, I mean, your, your business, you know, you really do want to minimize risk. You do. How, how do you think about that in terms of kind of balancing that desire to surge forward? with the, the concern also to make sure that it's, it's done safely. Yeah, I think an education piece is really important within the aerospace business. Um, within Eaton, we're about 50% commercial and 50% military. So obviously that military data, we have to hold incredibly closely and make sure that we don't leak any of that data. So a lot of my time is really spent educating our workforce on what is the proper use? What are good use cases? Where can we make advancements, but also keep the data safe? So I think it's really starting with that foundation of planting that seed and just getting people in the mindset of uh, we don't have to make 100% progress, but those little incremental pieces can start to add up over time. No, thanks. And but I, again, you know, I'm coming back to this, the, 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 the difference you see, you, you know, you're looking at marketplaces. So it's, you know, you, you kind of, we go, we go from big, big things to very, very broad things. So uh, it's, it's a threat landscape for AI different for you, or do you see the same sort of pattern? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's multifaceted, right? I mean, obviously, when you think about from a skill set standpoint, you've got to upskill the, the, the people you have right now, and how do you do that? How do you do that at scale? How do you do that with so much noise around AI? And when do you start doing that? Because the signal to noise ratio is really hard to figure out because there's so much noise. I think, uh, you know, I'll give you another example of like, I, I was looking for somebody, a director of analytics. I had more than 900 resumes that were sent to me to that role. And I thought maybe, hey, you know, it's Microsoft, maybe that's why. And then I kind of started looking into it and I noticed that a lot of the resumes, a lot of the resumes had a lot of the exact same things I was looking for. And then I spoke to somebody else in a recruiting agency and they said like, you know, there's AI agents now that can flood a customized or create a customized resume based on what you have in the job description. So I was like, this is going to be a really hard job for me to kind of go there. But this is a threat, you could call it, because all of a sudden it's really hard to you know, delineate what's good quality person to hire, what's not. So these are just small examples, but important examples. I think I've been mean, incredibly bored and it will change the way we need to think about Yeah, things, you know, suddenly what, what was very hard you know, to do 900 suddenly becomes very easy. Yeah, uh, do, you, do you see that there's kind of this risk that the almost the opportunity of AI, which is to do stuff we've not been able to do before, it's the problem with AI. It's that we can now do stuff that we should yes, be doing. Absolutely right, and I think that's where it's very important to what the uh, you know has been talked about. There's one part of responsible AI heard off and all, which is focused on the models and the technology, but there's a larger part which is on you know acceptable usage. Right? How do you use AI properly, efficiently in a policy framework? So it's extremely important to train your, your workforce to ensure you have the right policies, you have the right user adoption you know, frameworks that drive you know, uh, usage of AI more responsibly within the organization and create the right use cases. So and I would completely agree with you. Uh, you need to have the right training to you know, follow your employees to ensure that they're using it in the right way, most effectively without breaking any rules, right? Mm -hmm. the, that's very important to be. But just to continue on that point, that it, you know, this is some, what's your advice in terms of implementing all of this? You know, how would you, how would you kind of, you know, talk to a customer who's thinking 
you know, do they know they need to do this? There's there's pressure. We've also a lot of scrutiny on on responsible AI and investment. Where where where's the yeah. where's the advice? To yeah, and I I think you know what uh, you know we talked about. It's very important to not make it like an ocean, but focus on specific use cases. But the aim, but at the same time, have the right philosophy, framework, and policy, which is enterprise wide, right? So you don't need to go for a killer, killer app, as you mentioned, but you do need to have some kind of framework on which you adopt AI across the enterprise, which is kind of uniform uh, to some aspect. Uh, the use cases could be, you know, based on where you see the uh, maximum business impact, uh, and all versus the risk that the use case might you know, uh, uh, might be having. So it would be based on the two metrics you can decide the right use cases. Uh, but definitely have a framework which is more prompted. Okay. I, yeah, I was just going to say that you know you, you're starting to see separation between people who are a little bit more advanced on this topic and people who are novices. And I think for the novices, I would say just play around with it, get comfortable yeah. with it. You know, this is not like you know some of these other technologies that have come our way or will come our way, like quantum computing or whatever else. This is actually accessible to all of us. So just experimenting with it. You know, this is one of the biggest things that we do is like act like an entrepreneur in a large company. How do you do that? Yeah. You can with tools like AI. And then when you get to uh, a little bit more maturity, we get to what he was talking about, which is like, you know, having more focused kind of small things that you are going after in a more directed manner, which actually then yield uh, opportunity in a more clear way. Yeah. So, and Alison, you, 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 you spoke about this, the starting this one. How, how do you decide what to prioritize, what to, what to choose, and, and you know, by default, then what not to what not to do? Yeah, I think this space can get very overwhelming because we've talked about this week, too, that, I mean, AI is embedded into everything now, or it's the buzz term that you hear everywhere. But really, I think the focus comes back to really, what are you, tr- what's the outcome that you're trying to get to? Um, can you prioritize based on business outcome, whether it's a problem that you're currently experiencing, um, something that's been a pain point maybe in the organization for a long time that is working good enough and so you just kind of have left it for a while. So really being honest, I guess, and looking at uh, all the possibilities and then just being uh, very blunt with what can the p- potential outcome be? Can this create a good story that will help then create a narrative in the organization to show real growth and real change and spur other ideas? Um, so I just always try to stay back with the outcome. Yes. Matthew, say, is it same? Yeah, yes, it's, it's similar, right? I just want us to be careful to not consider AI a solution looking for a problem. Yeah. It's an arrow on your quiver. So if you're facing a problem, let's consider AI. Maybe let's establish criteria of what will be good candidates for AI. Not every problem needs to have AI as a solution. Mm -hmm. However, when I do have candidates, I want to use something that has a low risk and a multiplier effect. Success is contagious. I want to start out with something that I know we can make successful. If that works, I'm done selling it. My customers will sell it. That's what I'm looking for. So if there is a problem for which AI is a good approach, it needs to be one that AI will sell itself. So that is my success criteria. No, thanks. So, I've heard just kind of draw some conclusions. You know, you're know, you right in the middle for so many customers about their, how they're prioritizing, but actually how, how we as, you know, at HL Tech have been prioritizing our investments. How have you seen that? Did, have you seen the difference between the way we think about it and the way our customers are thinking about that? Actually, you know, we see quite a bit of similarity between what customers think and how we look at it. Uh, when you look at CS Tech's internal adoption, actually, we are, we are a tech services major. So, it, you know, it, you know, generative AI and AI have direct impact on how we deliver ourselves, right? In fact, all of our customers expect us to have some AI or some automation uh, in our service portfolio. So that's something that is very relevant to us, and we are adopting it from a productivity efficiency and you know, on game standpoint. But the other aspect is how do we choose the right business use cases, adopt internally for our business processes, like whether it could be hiring, it could be uh, you know, finance, it could be supply chain, what can we do there? So those are you know, the business use cases on which we're kind of implementing AI within HCL. Uh We do a lot of work, and very, it's very interesting to see that you know, where we've seen maximum impact for customers is when they choose to choose or not use cases to your point and make it successful, right? Make the new skin successful. Mm. And so it, what 
customers should not do is have 10 things going on okay. and five things fail and then you don't, you put, you stop, right? And that's what you don't, you don't do because you will adopt AI, right? So that, that path is on. You just need to ensure that you're on the right path. Right, so, and you have final comments? Yeah, no, look, I think this is one of those things where ton of excitement, ton of opportunity and ton of anxiety as well. Could be, it's kind of, I had, to, I had to overuse the word polarization in this environment, but that is exactly how a lot of uh, uh, people are feeling about this, and it's understandable. But uh, but I, think, I, I I always think, you know, I like to be very optimistic of any new technology that's come in the many, many years that we've had these technology trends, and I, I look at it in a very bullish way, which is I think if done properly with the right guardrails, this can be a... Uh, not just an incremental opportunity, but a monumental opportunity. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks. Any, any final words? Exciting times. Exciting times. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see even a year from now, right. you know, how far we've come and what um, good stories we can evangelize about the use of AI. Yeah. To but nice shows across all industries. And next time your panelist will be an AI agent. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I think maybe I'll be, uh, I'll be sitting on the beach. And <laughs> but look, everyone, thank you. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I do believe that we're at a pivotal point um, for all of our industries. There's a there's significant challenge, um, but there's also a, a big opportunity, both for our businesses and for society. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's for us to think through responsible AI, the risk of it, and then how we deploy that across our businesses and, and, and be leaders in that. So, you know, I said, thank you very much. I really enjoyed this, uh, this session. I hope you have too. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.